Hello, welcome to Evidence-Based Medicine. I'm Dr. Epling. Today, the introductory lecture will, be, lecture will be talking about the basics of critical appraisal. What does it mean to actually critical, critically appraise a study? Um, this is essential to understand just to get the basic framework of why we're bothering to go ahead and read through studies. Um, so this forms the basis, the outline of what you'll be doing uh, with each of the articles that come. So critical appraisal, we can be critical, we can critically appraise any information source. For this course, we're going to mainly focus on original research studies, studies like randomized controlled trials, studies about certain drug therapies, diagnostic test studies. We're going to focus on those original studies, but the principles are the same. You can look at any information source in medicine and try to figure out whether it's valid, whether it's applicable, or, and what the results are, what the conclusions are. So the purpose of critical appraisal is to really think deeply about it in order to detect any place where there might be bias and error. Uh, we'll define those terms in a little bit, but really, if there's a lot of bias or error in a study, then you don't really have any reason to read the study. It's an invalid study and can just point you in the wrong direction when you're taking care of patients. You need to understand the results and under, understand the significance and the magnitude of the results. In other words, how big a difference does this particular intervention make? Um, is it statistically significant or is it clinically significant? We'll describe all those terms later. And then you need to assess critically whether or not this knowledge that the study this, that this study shows is really applicable to your patients. Now, if you're a medical student, I know you don't have any patients yet. That's fine. But what we're talking about is either applicability or generalizability. Applicability, if you're talking about trying to answer a question for one patient. Generalizability, if this, you think this study could generally be applied to your patients that you see. And so we'll need a little bit of uh, practice with deciding what's really applicable or not, and we'll get to that later in the sessions. Critical appraisal has five elements, um, and, and these you should try to think about for every single journal article that you read. So if you get stuck at some point and don't know where to start with an article, remember these five things. The first is what is the research question? Second is what is the design of the study? What study design is it? Is it a control trial, case control, etc.? And we'll go over those designs. What's the study's validity? Can the study actually tell us something about the sample that they studied? What are the study's actual results? What, is, what did the authors present as um, the statistics they have for what happened in their study? How did one group do compared to the other? What were the overall, uh, what was the composition of the study sample? All these are study results. And then finally, what's the study's generalizability or applic applicability? And we talked about that before. Those are the five questions. What's the question? What's the design? and the validity results in applicability. For the question, it's you, you can usually find this at the end of the introduction section in most journal articles, the introduction or background section. This, the authors will spend a long time talking about the background of the issue, and then at the end they'll say, well, we wanted to study this. And it's usually formed in terms of a question, or we'll have the elements of the, of the study des design that they've conducted. If you can translate that into something called a PICO format, uh, which you should have learned about before, the PICO format helps you organize this question a little bit. Who are the patients or the population that they talked about? What's the intervention of the exposure that they studied? What did they compare that intervention or exposure to? In other words, if one set of patients got an intervention, a vaccine, a drug, or whatever, what did they compare those patients to? Was it to no drug? Was it to a different drug? Was it to a placebo? That's the comparison. And then outcome. What outcome did they study? It's always important to kind of keep an eye on that because um, designers of studies can sometimes get a little bit funny with what the outcomes are. And you need to keep a keen eye to see if that outcome really matters to your patient. There can be also a lot of secondary questions or outcomes that authors can ask. And oftentimes, it'll be hard to figure out what the primary question is, what the main question is of the study, in the midst of all these other secondary questions and outcomes. But try to keep that straight. The next task is to identify the study design. What, what design, what epidemiologic design did the authors use to answer this question? The ones that I think you should know are six. Randomized controlled trial, this is the kind of the gold standard for deciding if something works in medicine or not. So it's where they randomize people to one intervention or another and then follow them over time to see if, see if that intervention works, if it makes a difference. A controlled trial uh, is similar, it's just not randomized. And most journal studies these days uh, don't just do plain old controlled trials. They don't choose the intervention 
specifically for our patient. They let random processes decide who gets the intervention and who doesn't. The rest of these are studies. They're observational studies. And the difference between a trial and a study is, in trials, the researchers are doing something to a patient. In other words, they're assigning one group an intervention versus the other group. In studies, you're seeing who has the exposure and who doesn't have the exposure, but that's often decided by somebody else. In other words, they're just looking for people who are on a certain medicine or and not on a certain medicine. Or they're looking for people that have had an exposure or don't have an exposure. So these are prospective and retrospective cohort studies. These are just following people over time. Prospective cohort is when you start with people with an exposure and, and a group of people without the exposure and follow them forward over time. A retrospective cohort study is taking a bunch of data that's already been collected, organizing it by the exposure, and then following it over time to see who, and usually the outcome has already happened in the past, so you follow it over time to see who had the outcome. But all of the data, both the exposure and the outcome data, happened in the past. A case control study is uh, where you assign, you, you determine the groups by their outcome. In other words, you do this for rare outcomes like brain cancer or something like that. You would find a bunch of people with brain cancer and a bunch of people without brain cancer and go back and look for exposures. When they do this with uh, figuring out the effectiveness of medications or something, they're often doing uh, safety analyses of medications. There was a classic one in the 90s of calcium channel blockers and a concern about calcium channel blockers causing stroke. And what they did in, this, in one of the studies was they found a bunch of people that had a stroke and compared them to a bunch of people that didn't and looked back and found that the people with strokes tended to be exposed to calcium channel blockers more than the people that did not have strokes. That would be kind of what a case control study does in the realm of a uh, therapy study, for instance. And then finally, a cross-sectional study. These are of limited value because all you're assessing is whether or not somebody has the exposure and the outcome, and you're assessing that all at the same time. So if somebody says uh, on a survey that they don't exercise very much and they also happen to have diabetes, you could draw an association between lack of exercise and diabetes, but you can't really tell if one causes the other because you don't have that time factor in there. We've been through these, uh, these studies in epidemiology courses. You can certainly look online for more explanation of these. I think you need to have these study designs uh, fairly well committed to memory. Um, the best study, remember, depends on the type of question. So uh, if your question is about a therapy, which therapy is better, or, or uh, does one therapy work better than no therapy, then a randomized controlled trial is the best study you can have. But for a diagnostic test, randomized controlled trials really don't apply. The best type of study for a diagnostic test study is a prospective cohort study. So it really depends on the type of question you're asking. And in each of the study examples we'll give, we'll talk about which is the best study type. And remember that validity is really important. How they do the study will increase your confidence in the results and really determines whether or not you really need to read the rest of the paper. If it is a poorly constructed study, they will tend to overemphasize or, or um, cause the study to show more of an effect than, than the intervention truly has. So a poor quality study overestimates the effect of, of the intervention. So in general, you want a really good quality study and then, you, then take the time to read the rest of the the study. Validity is the first real part of critical appraisal that tends to trip people up. But it's basically this, that you want to look, look and make sure the study was conducted in such a way that the results you get for that sample, remember we're sampling in studies to apply that knowledge to the rest of the population, was the study constructed so that you don't get a biased result. And bias is systematic error that produces bad conclusions or erroneous conclusions. In other words, there's something wrong with how you conducted the study that makes it just as likely that that error caused the conclusion you're seeing and not the intervention. So what am I talking about? If we, if we conduct a study, a prospective observational study that shows that smoke, and we're trying to link smoking and lung cancer, then anybody that works in an asbestos industry, for instance, like in shipbuilding or in, um, in construction or something like that, if they're also exposed to asbestos, that's a bias in the study called confounding that could have accounted for the result of lung cancer in a way that's different than just smoking. So you have to think about all the things that could account for that. 
Similarly, in a drug trial, if you don't randomize appropriately, then for, for just chance reasons, you could end up with a, with a sample, one sample that doesn't look like the other sample. And if you're comparing those two samples and trying to figure out if the drug works, you have to account for the fact that there may be differences between the groups that are not simply due to chance or the exposure of interest. And that would be a confounded result. Uh, and again, an invalid study is not really worth reading. That if you have bias in a study, if you randomized inappropriately, if you have, don't have blinding or masking, which we'll get to, um, if you lose too many people in a study, if there are the presence of other confounders, any of these things can overestimate the effect of what you're looking at. And so you would come to a, an inappropriate conclusion. Results are important. And what you're doing here, there are often uh, several different types of results that you look at. Descriptive statistics generally tell you who's in the study. Now we have explicit ways to get people into the study, inclusion and exclusion criteria. But the first part of the results should be an explanation of who you actually got into the study. And they'll generally be laid out, they can either be laid out in the whole population or um, separated by groups if you're comparing groups. So these are descriptive statistics. You'll see means, you'll see medians, uh, you'll see standard deviations and uh, interquartile ranges. We'll talk about each of those uh, coming up. Um, but those are the type of statistics you'll generally see. Comparisons and inferential statistics are the next things. These are the relative risks and odds ratios, absolute risk reductions. These are the statistics that compare one group with the other group to see if the intervention makes a difference and how much of an intervention or how much of an intervention, how much of a difference the intervention makes. And then you'll see tables, texts, and graphs that, that are responsible for conveying the results. A lot of results are buried in text sometimes. They're not always represented in tables. And some results are only represented in tables and not in text. So in the results section, you actually have to read through pretty carefully to understand where the results are. You'll see point estimates, which are the, the specific statistics, like a relative risk. And then when, when you look at statistical significance, you'll see standard deviations, measures of error in your estimate. You'll see confidence intervals, which are another way to express error or um, a range of possibilities for your point estimates. And that's what confidence intervals do too. Now, just to show you some examples of, of graphs and the way, what critical appraisal is when you look at graphs, you see this, uh, this graph that is a survival curve, and it's not important in what it's about, but it looks like there's a difference, doesn't there? There's some white space in between gene A and gene B, and it's followed over years, and you see the percent of survival. But the key and where you have to bring a critical framework to this is just because you see a difference between those two lines doesn't necessarily mean that that's a statistically significant difference. The authors have to give you other information for you to be able to understand whether that's statistically significant, like a p-value between those, those two lines. Uh, there are different ways to express that, and some of them we'll get to later on. But just remember, you have to don't just look at a graph and say, oh, well, that looks that it's significant, because it, so it must be. You have to really think a little bit harder about what could explain those differences. Similarly, you want to be able to spot bad graphs, and this is an example of a bad graph. There may be useful information on here, and you'll see plenty of, exa plenty of examples of graphs like these in the medical literature, where it's just really hard to figure out what the authors are trying to talk about. And so you want to be able to identify graphs that you frankly shouldn't waste your time on trying to figure out. Um, ideally, journal editors and other people will catch these and try to make them uh, a little bit easier to read but some of them can be confusing, even the well-done ones. The last bit that we talk about is generalizability. And this is that question about whether or not, so assuming a study is valid and you understand what the results are, the final question is, do these results really apply to my patient? And uh, so you can take that from a couple of different standpoints. You can think, well, I don't have any patients right now, but I kind of know who's in the area. And so in general, would I use this? So if I'm looking from a about a if I'm looking at a study from Africa, for instance, in very malnourished patients in Africa, is that really going to apply to somebody in Syracuse, New York? It it would be it would be tough. And your job then is to use your medical knowledge and other knowledge and maybe consultation with an expert to really understand if you're talking about the same sorts of patients that this intervention could apply to. And that's what we'll say is generalizability, the ability to apply to a set of patients I'm likely to see. 
applicability I use to kind of differentiate the, the reasons why you might be doing this, reading this article in the first place. And if you're reading this article to answer a question about a specific patient, then you want to think more about applicability. And the question to ask there is, could my patient get into this study? Could they have gotten into this study? Do they meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria? And um, do, do they otherwise look like the patients who are in this study? So that's a more focused example of this generalizability. And again, this talks about why you're reading the study. Are you just generally keeping up to date, in which case the generalizability question is more appropriate, or are you finding an answer to a specific question, in which case the applicability question. Um, the questions you would ask, do the subject study look like my patient or patients? Other questions, does the outcome really matter? This gets to a, uh, a common issue in medical research in that the, the outcome that authors choose to study can really influence whether or not it's, it's a good idea to read this study or not. As a primary care physician, I will tend to only spend time looking at articles that really have patient-oriented outcomes, outcomes that make the patient feel better, live longer, have less morbidity and mortality somehow, um, improve their quality of life, those type of things. If I tried to read every article that came out ever, I would quickly drown in a sea of medical information. But if you're more specialized, you may want to read that earlier literature, the things that change the chemical compositions in the blood or change the, the nerve conduction velocities on a, a nerve conduction test, something like that. Stuff that, that patients can't really interpret or feel, but may still be important for you. And certainly if you don't have the patient-oriented oriented evidence, the patient-oriented outcomes, then all you can really rely on is the more disease-oriented outcomes. We'll go through examples of each of those as we, as we uh, walk through the rest of the modules. And then finally, can I use these results? And what I mean by that is, is the intervention or the diagnostic test or whatever we're talking about, is it really feasible? Is it available to us? Is it cost effective? In other words, can patients afford it? Can I write for it? Will insurances pay for it? The real practical questions of whether or not you can use the results of this study. And these are important questions to ask. If you uh, spend all your time reading a study and you don't actually have that intervention available, then you'll feel like you've wasted your time. So it's a good idea to kind of screen studies for, to make sure that you could actually use this intervention. Or you may be in a position to advocate for, for getting this. You may be on the pharmacy and therapeutics committee at a hospital and say, you know, we really need to use this drug because it's a valid study, the results are really good, and it would apply to our patients. So this is a practical question. Can we use these results? So again, that's the, that's the end of this uh, topic. We talked about what the research question is, defining that research question well, identifying the design of the study because the validity aspects of the study depend on what design it is, looking critically at the study's validity, did they do the study well enough to show good results for that sample, what were the results, and do I really understand what the results are, and have I made sure that they're statistically and clinically significant, and then finally, the study's generalizability or applicability. Can I apply this study to my patients or to the patient I need an answer on? So that's the end of this module. Um, I will see you in the next module.